If you have your Bibles, please open to second, or excuse me, 1 Kings 19, and we'll continue on with our series on Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19 is where we are this morning. Elijah has accomplished the great victory of his life. Everything has led up to this point. He was called by God to confront Ahab, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, who was seeking to basically wipe out worship of Yahweh from the kingdom and establish the worship of the Baals and the Asherah as the official religion of Israel, uh, encouraged by his bride Jezebel. So he confronts him and said, uh, Yahweh is Lord and it's not going to rain until I say it rains. He was then hidden by the brook Kareth or Cherith. Ravens fed him. God provided for him during that time. Later he was hidden uh, with a widow in Zarephath, which is the uh, country that Jezebel came from. And that, with the miracle that was that the uh, jars of grain and oil would not go dry. He even raised the widow's son from the dead. And God was preparing him for the big one. He came back and to Ahab and called for the showdown between one prophet of Yahweh, Elijah, and 450 prophets of Baal. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. And as you know, it was the great victory. The prophets of Baal spent all day doing their prayers, their incantations, their dancing, even cutting themselves, and nothing happened. No fire came down from heaven. Elijah did one prayer, and fire came down, consuming not only offering and the wood, but the very stones that the altar was made of. Great victory. Then he came to Ahab and said, okay, now it's going to rain. And he had to wait a while for that rain to come, but it did the greatest victory of his life, and now he is running as fast as he can to beat Ahab back to Jezreel because this thing is not over yet. Why was he in such a hurry to get back to Jezreel and beat Ahab? He wanted to witness firsthand the consummation of this great victory when Ahab came to Jezebel, the instigator of Baal worship, and said to her, Yahweh has proven himself victorious over Baal. All the Baals have to go. Get your Asherahs out of here, and maybe you even have to go, queen. Yahweh is God. That's what he was waiting for. That's what he went back early to see. Because Jezebel was not at Mount Carmel. And those 400 prophets of Asherah that ate at her table did not make it to that showdown either. So this was going to be the grand finale, the conclusion of this great victory. But there was a problem. The problem was that Ahab did not wear the pants in the royal family. So we pick it up in chapter 19 of 1 Kings. Now Ahab told Jezebel what he, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. Oops. In the brass band playing uh, in Elijah's head, the, the song of victory, this is a... This is not what he expected. He expected the culmination of this great victory for Yahweh, he was an Israelite. He saw this as the turning of his nation back to God. After all, they were all shouting on Mount Carmel, Yahweh is the Lord, Yahweh is the Lord, and they killed all the prophets of Baal. He was going to come see the official conclusion and climax of that, and guess what? It didn't happen. All he got was a contract out on his life. Basically, Jezebel saying to him, you're a dead man. You have less than a day to live. So what does he do? Verse 3. He runs. And he was afraid, and arose, and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. He ran for his life. He heard the message from Jezebel. He turned and went as fast as he could go. And by the way, going to Beersheba was about 100 miles. No roads, no cars, no bikes. It was in the southern kingdom. He went down into Judah, where they worshipped Yahweh still. And he went about as far south as you can go in Judah. And then left his servant. Basically, he was done. He was retiring. It was over, as far as he was concerned. This is the mighty Elijah, who has done everything right to this point. And now, there he is. He leaves his servant. You look at verse 4. 
He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life for I am not better than my father's. Here we have the mighty Elijah leaving his servant. He's given up. He's quitting. He's done. Goes out in the wilderness, flops down under a tree and says, just kill me. I don't even want to live. I am a failure. He is quitting the game. He just had his greatest victory. I mean, this is right after Mount Carmel, when Yahweh proved himself superior. What happened to this guy? All of a sudden, we see him just depressed, quitting, almost suicidal, saying, I'm done. I'm an absolute failure. So what was the problem here? What happened? Well, if you notice in this text, there's several things that happened to Elijah. First one was he stopped listening to God. I want to draw your attention back to chapter 17 very quickly. A few pages back. Chapter 17, verse 2, says, The word of the Lord came to him, saying... And that's when he went off to the brook at Cherith. When he was in trouble the first time, he went to Ahab and said to his face, it's not going to rain until I say it rains. And by the way, his life was in danger. Ahab spent the next several years looking for him. And the word of the Lord came and said, take off. Go to the brook Cherith. Then when that water dried up at Cherith, verse 8 of chapter 17, the word of the Lord came to him saying, go to Zarephath. An unusual place, but that's what the word of the Lord said. Now, verse chapter 18, go to chapter 18, next page over probably. When it was time for him to leave Zarephath and confront Ahab again, verse 18, chapter 18, verse 1, Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Okay, the word of the Lord spoke to him. Even when he outran uh, Ahab to Jezreel, it says in chapter 18, verse 46, the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab. Every step of the way, he was following the commands of the Lord. Now look back down to 19.4. Actually, 19.3. He was afraid and arose and ran for his life. He stopped listening to the Lord. At every step, he moved when the Lord commanded it. The Lord had taken care of him in every, at every point. He had risked his life twice. There were suicide missions going before Ahab, saying, Yahweh is the Lord, and it's not going to rain. And the second time saying, Yahweh is the Lord, and I want to prove it to you on Mount Carmel. But now, after hearing this latest, his life is threatened. He doesn't wait for the voice of the Lord. He turns and runs as fast as he can. I'll tell you another problem, what I think is really the problem with Elijah. He became emotionally attached to the mission. And understand what I'm saying when I say that. He fully expected a certain outcome. See, he was an Israelite. This was his country. These were his people. It was killing him that they were worshiping the Baals instead of Yahweh. And God had called him to set things right. And this great victory, all of his people were saying once again, Yahweh is Lord. This was the greatest thing you can imagine. The only outcome he had in his mind was that he was going to come back and it was going to be total victory and, and Jezebel and her Asherah and Baals were going to be thrown out. And instead of waiting to see what the Lord had him do, he decided what the outcome should be because he was emotionally attached to it. He was not ready for that outcome. He felt it had to go this way. He wanted it so much that when it didn't happen, it knocked him right off his horse. He wasn't following the Lord here. He was following his own desires. By the way, we have to be a little bit careful in that area. Patriotism, patriotism is a good thing, right? Unless, of course, it's an idol. If America is more important to you than the kingdom of God... Straight up, it's an idol. It's flat-out idolatry, as blatant as worshiping a golden calf. Right? Instead of waiting to see what the Lord had in store, he had in his mind that, no, Israel, this, this had to be it. Israel had to win. By the way, are you, in your mind, are you aware of the fact that America is probably not going to last long term? 
that we right now, we as a nation, are exactly in line with every other great nation that has fallen in just about, you compare it to the Roman Empire, compare it to Israel, if you like, we're, we're following in those footsteps exactly. Would that outcome drive you into depression? If so, it's idolatry. We are people of the kingdom of God. You know what? The kingdom of God has no country. I'm not the biggest fan of the American flag back here, and I love my country. But America's the only nation that puts their flag in a church. Did you know that? Because the church of Jesus Christ, we should have every nation under earth there. His people are all tribes and tongues and nations. I'm probably going to get some people not liking this message at this point. Because you mess with patriotism, you're, it's like messing with your kids, you know. You you're better go easy there. But isn't it the truth? Kingdom of God, America's nothing in the kingdom of God. It may come, it may go. America's come and America's go. Yeah, it's been a great country because we followed some of the Judeo-Christian principles. And I believe that's the reason for our greatness. But we're not going that direction now. Every country before us gone like that has, has gone. Bye-bye. He was fully expecting this great outcome, and that's what threw him. He was no longer following God. He was following his own desires to see his nation fully repent. And that wasn't God's program here. Israel was not going to repent. Israel was going to be judged. The purpose for the Mount Carmel's is to reveal that their judgment was absolutely deserved, and God is righteous in his judgment, because all those wonderful Yahweh is lords on Mount Carmel were not going to last. True repentance lasts. It's easy to repent when you see something fantastic. What about the dust, when the dust settles? And in this case, and the politicians get a hold of it. A different story. So Elijah became emotionally attached to the mission, and he missed the mission. And when it didn't turn out the way he envisioned it, he was done. That was it. And then he lost hope. And you know what the issue really was? He was focusing on himself. When the Lord speaks to him, down a little further in this passage, it's kind of interesting what he says. And I'm going to jump ahead, jump down to verse 10. We're going to get there in the text, but just jump down quickly. When the Lord says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He says to him, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Did you catch all the I's and me's in there? I've been good, they've been bad, I'm all alone, and I'm not happy about it. And I'm quitting. I'm done. Just kill me. Take my life. It was all about himself. All those things. He stopped listening to the Lord. He became emotionally attached to the mission. And he focused on himself and lost hope. Now, I want you to notice what the solution is to this. Because God takes care of this guy. We're not, this isn't it for Elijah. He's had a, a great prophetic ministry up until this point, And now he's just fallen off the horse. But look what happens. Go down to verse 5. Chapter 19. He lay down and slept under the juniper tree, and behold, an angel, there was an angel touching him and said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights, that was some good food, to Horeb, the mountain of God. Look what God does. He was at this point burned out, depressed, and quitting. That's exactly where he was. God starts with him on bodily rest and nourishment. You know what people need that are burned out and depressed? First thing they need is rest and nourishment. When you think about it, now it, just look back at the events here. Mount Carmel happened after Mount Carmel happened, and he was about, you said it's going to rain now. He told Ahab, you go eat and drink. I'm going up and praying. He went up and prayed. He didn't eat. And when it started raining, he ran ahead of Ahab to Jezreel, which by the way is 20 miles. 
Now, I want to challenge you, when, when we get into spring and the snow is gone, try not eating someday and then running from here to Fergus Falls. See what happens. That's how he was physically. And then he heard this news and he just took off running. And I think part of his problem out there in the desert was exhaustion. How does the Lord deal with him? He starts out by saying, okay, here, food. Now rest. Now here's some more food. Not a bad way to go. The Lord knows what he's doing. And then he calls him to come to Horeb, which, by the way, is Mount Sinai. That's where Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments, met with God, came down glowing. That's the place. That was about a 200-mile journey. 40 days and 40 nights, by the way, on that one meal. There's some supernatural stuff going on there. But the next thing he does is he, he brings him to himself. He needs to be brought back to God. That's what he's lost track of. It was all about him. He forgot about what God was doing here and how God had protected him and provided for him at every step of the way. So he brings him on one meal, which is a God thing, to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, to meet God. And the next thing he does is he clarifies his vision that was become cloudy because of his own emotional attachment and his own focus on himself. And here's how he does it as we go down this passage. Verse 9. He came to where the cave, to a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? What's going on? What's up with you? I'm sort of paraphrasing a little bit there. And that's when he broke into his litany. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. The Holy of hosts, the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I've been good, they've been bad, I'm all alone. So God said to him, he didn't say this, but here's what it was. You need some clarification on just who you are and who I am, says the Lord. So he said to him, verse 11, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord was passing by. And you have to just kind of take this a, a thing at a time and put yourself in that place. A great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking it into pieces, the rocks before the Lord. A wind that was strong enough to be ripping a mountain apart was out there. Wow, that's a God thing, right? By the way, most, all, all human cultures have a, a God-shaped vacuum in their heart, and they have to fill it with some kind of gods. What do most human cultures, down through the history of humankind, where do they always begin with their religion? They worship the forces of nature, right? The god of thunder, the god of the storm, the god of the sun, the god of the waters. This is like a God thing. But guess what? God wasn't there. He was not in that. Let me get back to the right page here. After that wind was an earthquake. The whole mountain was shaking. That's a God thing, right? But God was not in the earthquake. And then there came fire. This mountain caught on fire. Boy, that's a God thing. That was what came down, right? And Carmel and took all the sacrifice out of the way. That was the great victory. Fire from heaven. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound, and this translation says, of gentle blowing. Do you know what the literal Hebrew is? A voice of silence. A silent voice is literally what the Hebrew, we say still small voice, right? That's what the translation we're used to. The literal Hebrew says a voice of silence, a silent voice. Nothing. But God was there. What was he teaching Elijah? What was this all about? Elijah, who had seen miracle after miracle after miracle, whether it was ravens bringing him burgers and fries every day at, at Cherith, or a, a jars that never went down with oil and, and flour, or a, a son being raised from the dead, or this great thing he saw on Carmel, he was expecting something great to happen when they came back and met Jezebel, what was God telling him? Do not put me in a box. Do not think God has to work in certain ways. 
the voice of silence. God's working is not just through the miraculous. God's working is just as powerful through the silent, unseen, when it seems like there's nothing there and nothing happening. He's saying to Elijah, do you think nothing's happening right because it didn't go the way you wanted it to? Do you think something's wrong because you didn't win? You need to understand who God is. God is not just the God of miracles. God is the God of silence. You know, there's many Christians that want to see miracles if they want to think God is really there. And it can get you into trouble because you can chase after those things. And the problem is miracles are not just the realm of, of God. The enemy can do those too. In fact, that's when you look at the end times in the book of Revelation, that's one of the ways the Antichrist will deceive the world is through the miraculous. Now, God does work through the miraculous. Obviously, he did in Elijah's life. He's done in the history of the church. He still does today. But what God is saying to Elijah is, don't think you have me figured out. I'm always doing more than you ever dreamed. Even when it seems like nothing is happening, don't think nothing is happening. Because I actually think God works more through the silent and the invisible than he does through the outward and the miraculous. Don't put God in a box and say he has to work in a certain way. God works in ways that you do not see. And then he gives him another assignment, if you will. We're going on to verse 13 now. When Eli we'll, we'll, go, we'll start here, 13. Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face and his mantle and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, the voice came to him. And God said again, through this silent voice, by the way, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, and we don't know, by the way, it's just written in the language here, but I suspect he had a little bit different tone now. You know, instead of saying, I have been very zealous, he probably said, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life. He'd been practicing this, obviously. He, on his way there, those 40 days and 40 nights, he's going, okay, here's what I'm going to tell God. I got it down to a, to a memorized little thing here. Here's what God says to him, verse 15. Go and return your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you will anoint Hazael king over Aram, Jehu the son of Nimshi you shall anoint as king over Israel, and Elijah, Elisha the son of Japhath of Adel Mahola you shall anoint as a prophet in your place. And it shall come about, the one who escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will put to death. The one who escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now this is interesting. He says, anoint these two guys. What you need to know is, this was symbolic, this wasn't literal. He never went and anointed these guys. In fact, these rulers were not there until after he was long gone. These were not the immediate successors to these countries. These were a couple kings down that God was going to use. What he's saying to him, I don't just work through the miraculous. I don't just work from fire from heaven. I work through what seems to be the normal course of hu human history with people coming into office and coming into power and others going out of power. It is really God there. When he says to them, anoint though, he says, okay, here, here's, here's where I'm working now. Here's where I'm working. I am working in these guys. I'm working in Jehu, who, by the way, was an ungodly king of Israel. There were no godly kings in Israel, the northern kingdom. He was an ungodly king. By the way, Hazad was a king of Aram, a, an enemy nation. This would be like coming to someone today and saying, okay, let's say there's an Elijah today. Here's what I'm doing. I am working through the future ruler of Iran, and an ungodly American president. We Christians go, what? That can't be God's will. Remember the still small voice. He's working in ways we do not see. This again, get back to politics. This is why political election should never crush us. They just show what God's doing. It may not be what we want. But when we put on our kingdom of God brain and say, oh yeah, okay, I don't get it, but okay, God. 
he was using Jehu and Hazad. And Elisha, of course, the obvious one, as you go on with the life of Elijah, he does find Elisha. He never really anoints him, but he does kind of let him tag along, and eventually he becomes the prophet in his place. But what God is saying here is, your work, I still have one more job for you, but you know what? It's not going to be much. You're not going to see too much of that supernatural stuff, but know that I'm working through the very, very mundane. My will is being done. And by the way, his will for Israel, the northern kingdom, was complete and utter, ju utter judgment, ceasing to even be a nation. They were gone. They were wiped out by the Assyrians, and they never came back. Whenever you get to these, by the way, these Christian groups that talk about the lost children of Israel that migrated from the north, that's, that's so unhistorical, it's ridiculous. They were wiped out, they were absorbed by Assyria. The faithful remnant, the believers of all those northern tribes that held to Yahweh worship trickled down south where they're still worshiping Yahweh during the course of all this. So that southern kingdom, Judah, contained all 12 tribes in their faithful remnant presence. But the northern kingdom was gone, and that was God's will. And he used people like Elijah to show that it was a righteous judgment. And he used people like Jehu, an ungodly king, and Hazael, a, a king of Aram, and Elisha, who has another uh, quite interesting career as a, as a prophet. But what he needed to learn was it was not about him, and it was not supposed to go the way he wanted to go. God was working. And his job was to be faithful. Not successful, by the way. It seemed like a great success on Carmel. That was his one moment of success. Everybody shouting, Yahweh is God, Yahweh is God. It didn't last very long. In the big picture, his job was not to be successful. And by the way, when you stop and look at the people in Scripture, most of them were called to failure. Isaiah was called by God. Isaiah chapter 6. Remember that vision in the temple of the Lord and, and says, who can I send? And, and Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And then he says, okay, I want you to go and talk to a people that are not going to listen to you. That's what he told him. He said, I have a message for you to proclaim to these people. And by the way, they're not going to get it. He was called to fail. The apostles were all martyred, except for John. They were called to die for their faith. Die early. Die young. How many people in Scripture do we see, who are, especially the prophets, who were called to do something that looked like a failure, but what they were called to be was faithful? And friends, that's what we are called to be. That's, as, as Christians, God calls us to follow him and to put his kingdom first and his righteousness, and he'll add all these other things and know that some things he calls us to do are not going to be popular. We may be hated for living the way we are called to live. We may be called haters and intolerant, and, and we will in this day and age. There's coming a day very, very soon, already here in some places, where proclaiming the word of God as it is in every place will at some point have you accused of hate speech. We're not called to success. We're called to faithfulness. Being a Christian will not make you rich. In fact, if you're faithful, very often, it will make you poorer than you would have been if you weren't so giving. Some of these things that Elijah had to learn are ours to learn today as well. God is bigger than we think. What we understand of God is a, a small, tiny, tiny little speck of who he is. And he's doing things that we don't even see. And when it seems like he's absent, let me give you a clue. Our God never is. And when you're in situations that you say, where is God? He's there. He's just doing something that wasn't according to your plan. And he calls us to follow and be faithful wherever we are with whatever he has given us. And if we find ourselves falling off the horse and burned out and depressed and ready to quit. Let's look at this one. First thing you need to do is get some rest. Get yourself well. And then seek the Lord. Let him clarify things for you. 
Go to, whatever is in your life, the equivalent of go to Sinai. Get away with God. So that he can clarify that. But what he's likely to do at some point is say, okay, you know what your problem really is? It's been all about you. Get over it and get on with it. No, our God doesn't, you know, that's, when the time is right and only God knows that. I'm not recommending you go to people who are depressed and say, get over it and get on with it. But ultimately, that's what God does with us when we're ready, when the time is right, when he's got our attention, when we're in his presence. Because it's all about him and his glory and his kingdom. So let us learn from Elijah, a great man of God, a great man of faith. And if he can fall off the horse, don't think you or I can't. Let's pray.